Most organisms are adapted to survive the conditions around them, and many don't do well when they're put in new conditions. However, some of them do very well. Too well. They'll dominate other organisms that weren't adapted for them, and they'll mess everything up. In this video, I'll talk about invasive species on a planet called Origin. The first is an insect from an island called Senex. It eats the leaves of flowering plants, but there's not many flowering plants there, and it stays in healthy numbers thanks to parasitic wasps in the area. Those gosh darn parasitic wasps. I'll talk about them someday. This bug evolved this way because the plant it's used to eating is toxic to most other animals, so it had its own little niche. When trade routes opened up, the little bug hitchhiked around to more diverse areas with more diverse plants. It's now a hated insect around the old world for how it decimates crops. People are encouraged to kill it, though some feel bad since it's quite a pretty little creature. It's called the striped lanternfly for its resemblance to a decorated paper lantern. It hatches in a cluster of 30 to 60 eggs under a leaf of a plant it could eat. The nymphs are black with white stripes till their last instar, when some of the white stripes turn red. Then they'll molt the last time into the adult form with a mostly black exoskeleton and a black and white striped forewings and red and black striped hindwings. By this point, they've eaten a lot of plant matter, and when their population is in the millions, you can see how it's a big problem. The nymphs often get eaten by the dragonflies and lizards and other little critters in many places, but these little critters are notably absent in farms. So to combat the lanternflies, some businesses are starting to set up their farms almost like a habitat for little critters to roam around in, which helps reduce numbers of lanternflies. Unfortunately, it also reduces efficiency of harvest, which is why not every farm has this setup. Lots of research is still being done to combat the invasive insects, but for now there's no easy answers. Another invasive animal is from Origin's tropical seas near the equator. It evolved venomous spines on many of its fins to ward off predators since it's not so big. It swims very slowly, but it's brightly colored on top of the spine so no one really wants to mess with it. Basically the epiphany of looking dangerous. In its natural habitat, it's predated on by giant bristle worms and eels that can get past its defenses. Unfortunately, the climate change caused by humans has warmed the seas enough that this fish was able to explore much beyond its home range. The already fragile ecosystems are further put in danger by the animal's voracious evening habits, and it's caused at least a few extinctions already in the last decade. It was named for its spines that vaguely resemble a recently extinct large feland. The lionfish is found around the world, and though it was historically seen as inedible, its population explosion has led it to being a common cheap street food anywhere near the ocean. Its venom isn't deadly to most people, but it's best to keep away from a live lionfish as contact with its spines can cause pain, nausea, and trouble breathing. While lionfish are usually no bigger than 10 to 20 centimeters long in their old home range, they've been found at massive sizes up to 2 meters long where they have no natural predators. Those sizes are rare though, because once they get bigger than a meter, they are targeted by apex predators like whales and marine archosaurs, also targeted of course by people. The third organism I want to talk about is actually a plant. This might be the first time I talk anything in depth about a sedentary plant. It's a real interesting one though, I swear. It originates in low tide island, which still gets cold enough in the winter to keep this plant at reasonable levels. It's able to fixate nitrogen from the air into the ground with bacteria in its fruits, which are very nutritious and sturdy. It can root pretty much anywhere as soon as it touches the ground, and makes huge vines that get everywhere if left alone. While they can reproduce sexually, it's this asexual reproduction that makes them so much of a problem in places they're not regulated. The plant is called La Manzana de la Tierra, or just ground apple when translated from Draconia. Most people call it Tierra Zana. Because it was so delicious and easy to grow, Draconia grew it in the Occidental mainland. It quickly grew out of control in places where winter isn't strong enough or doesn't come at all, and outcompetes and covers the other plants in the area. Much of the Occident is just covered in Tierra Zana and nothing else, which is at least nice for herbivores. Sometimes. It's great food for domesticated animals, but some specialized herbivores that only survive in one plant can and have gone extinct from Tierra Zana's rule. Another fish I want to talk about is one found commonly in rivers and lakes. It's native to the River of Blood near the city of Anthropos, and don't worry, it's not actually a river of blood, it's just called that, where it's adapted to the murky, low-quality water. It's good for eating, so the people there have brought the fish around to farm it until it ended up inhabiting nearly every body of water in the continent. They outcompete other fish and mess up fragile ecosystems. The Anthropocene government there hasn't done any research to stop it, because more carp means more food and money. This is the Anthropocene carp. 
It's used as a symbol for the conquest of the Anthropocene Empire, since you can put it anywhere and it'll take over. Like their military men say, with a drop of blood we can take a man, and with a man we can take a village. This carp has been domesticated into a few different breeds, but the most common one isn't so inbred. It can gulp air to make up for low oxygen levels, and when oxygen levels are fine, along with plentiful food, it can move surprisingly fast and get as big as 3 meters long. They're omnivorous and will eat literally anything they can. People have documented them jumping out of the water to catch birds, and a particularly large one was seen eating a wildebeest. Whether the carp killed the wildebeest or just scavenged it is unknown. Other governments in the continent are more interested in eradicating the Anthropocene carp, especially that of Lunix and Dreadland. Lunix is currently at war with Anthropocene, so it looks pretty bad if the symbol of the government they're fighting is alive in every body of water in the country. Dreadland has better education and slightly less corrupt government, so their interest in eradicating the carp has more to do with preserving the ecosystem. So far there's nothing we can do now other than encourage people to fish them, but a fun suggestion I heard is to use dark magic to make all the hatchlings male so they can go extinct in just a generation. Not sure how possible that is yet though. Lastly, I want to talk about a mammal from the Orient that's been taking over occidental ecosystems. It evolved to fill a small carnivore niche like related mustelids, but got substantially bigger when it diverged into a more omnivorous lifestyle. It can eat a wide variety of things from small animals to honey to carcasses to fruit. Most importantly though, it eats eggs. So an Anthropocene politician felt threatened by the existence of Nushus. Dragon shouldn't be intelligent, he said. This pol politician knew that Nushus laid eggs, and when he saw a certain creature eating the eggs of a greater bubblegum bird, he had an idea. The bear cat is a decently sized mammal with a voracious appetite. It grows fast and lives fast, never living more than 10 years. A population was introduced to draconian shores in a pitiful attempt to eradicate the powerful civilization. While bearcats have been responsible for the loss of exactly zero nuisance eggs, they have wreaked havoc on many animals. They compete with oviraptors and pretty much any mid-sized carnivore, and reduce populations of countless animals big and small. While it directly hunts small animals, it eats the eggs of anything, which can be particularly bad for large animals that don't lay very many of those. Eradication's efforts have evolved the hunting of the bear cat as food for domesticated animals, though that hasn't made a great deal of change in their population, especially because of the difficulty in getting the smarter ones like the hippogriff to actually eat new food. They're starting to push out bounties for dead bear cats, so we'll see if that makes any significant changes. That's about it for this video. Check out my Patreon, which you can subscribe to for just a dollar a month to support me and get your name at the end of my videos. Thanks Captain Kobop, Art of Dying, and Mr. Kill. I'm planning on putting out more Spike Emo videos, hope y'all don't mind the drop in Pokemon content. Let me know how you feel about it in the comments, and thanks for watching!